Welcome back. I'm now joined by Mpiwa Mangwiro Tsanga, regional campaigns and advocacy specialist from Sonke Gender Justice. And from our Cape Town studios, we're joined by a researcher at the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, Balense Matandela. And uh, welcome, Balense, as well as you, Mpiwa, here in Johannesburg. Pleasure to have you with us on Thank the program, you. even though we're discussing something that is not pleasant at all. Um, this has become so normal in South Africa that we only react once in a while, provided there's some drama around the story. And I think uh, in particular, given what happened, let me start with you, Balente, in Cape Town, because it is what happened in Cape Town that spurred the mm -hmm. students and the activists from all over the country mm -hmm. to go on a demonstration, the disappearance, the kidnapping, the rape, as well as ultimate murder of uh, Uyne and Mwechan. Yes, yes. Uh, so I think it was the organizing of Uyinene's uh, friends and, and the story of Uyinene, because for me specifically, um, I actually encountered some of her friends in Claremont uh, where she was kidnapped uh, and raped and murdered. And they were still in the process of looking for her. And uh, in, this was last week, Thursday. And in that process of looking for her, they had actually, her friends had gotten further than the police. And they had gotten footage of uh, Unene going to the police, the post office. So uh, in, th in that case, I think that her friends actually were uh, really integral in making sure that this case um, made everyone uh, reflect and made everyone ask themselves, am I next? Um, and a lot of people, when, when that am I next hashtag came out, uh, you, they didn't have to explain what it meant. Mm. I think as a woman in South Africa, you know when someone asks you, are you next? It's, it's, it, it kind of, that, that statement works on your fears that you uh, live with and walk with every day. Well, I, I don't think, you know, it's time for, for us to blame, but I want to talk about how the police dealt with this matter because it appears that mm. the suspect in this case, who's since been arrested, actually reported for work throughout the week, even when the protest was mm. being held outside the very same post office, and that he had a previous mm. conviction on a similar mm. type of crime. And how did the, mm. I mean, how did the police handle all of this, the search for Uyinene, and ultimately mm. the truth being revealed as a result of public pressure? So on social media, it's actually come out that uh, someone who was also advised to return to the post office, round about the same time Uyinene returned, uh, tried to come in to make a statement. And the way in which they handled that, they uh, didn't want to take the statement at first. They uh, were ca quite uh, lethargic, uninterested to, to take the statement from the woman. But had she decided to go back to that post office, she would have been another number. And of course, it's one incident that we're talking about, but according to statistics, mm. so we're told over 3,600 women get killed. Mm. Uh, per year in South Africa, which works mm. out to what about 10 a day, right? Every three, one hours, three hours, one every three hours mm. of shocking statistic. Mm. And we even have time mm. set aside around November, December, a campaign mm. that focuses the public on violence against women and children, but not much changes. Recently, the president mm. held the summit that discussed the same uh, 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 matter of violence against women not much change. What is it, do you think, about the psyche of our society that makes violence so prevalent and so normal, so everyday, Bill? Um, I think violence has become so normalized in our society mm -hmm. to, a, to a point where it's no longer shocking, really, particularly the murder of women. Yes, we have murders like Winene, we have murders like Karabo that will rally the whole nation and bring and create this whole, there's an outcry. But then there are so many other women who are killed out there. There's another woman, many other women and girls who died at the same time as Winene was mm. killed, if we use that statistics. Mm. But because of the way our society has been socialized into normalizing violence, 
violence, into normalizing. Uh, murder and violence is not something that is so shocking and so outrageous unless the circumstances are, as I say, they, they create public pressure. And also, it's the reaction that we have of the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system has really let us down so many times. The levels of impunity, the high attrition rates, the cases that fall off the system have made violence against women and, 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 and the murder of women something that perpetrators know I can always get away with. So because I can get away with it, I can do it again and again. And mm. for instance, as you already as you already alluded to, the accused uh, behind uh, Owini and Esmeda is someone who already has a previous conviction of a crime of a similar nature. Here is someone who's now being accused of murder and they are going to work every day, every other day, like it's business as usual. What if he had managed to lure another young lady and kill them again mm. in that process? Then you realize that mm. it's because violence has been is so perverse and it has been so normalized into our social fiber that sure. it's, it's and, no longer and, shocking. And even in some cultures, people claim that it is okay to be mm -hmm. violent against women, right? And I suppose as a researcher on Valentia, you can tell us a bit more about why Again, an old statistic I came across that between 75-80% of women that get killed or raped, that these crimes are committed against them by people, by perpetrators known to the victims. Mm. So it, it occurs uh, with intimate partners, it occurs with uncles. I think also uh, related to uh, the xenophobic violence currently in the country, um, I think even with the way in which we understand our own history, we don't look to other African countries, we don't value uh, some of the steps and some of the uh, policy steps they've made in order to advance and protect uh, women's rights, uh, but to also protect women against sexual and gender-based violence. And one example is of Sierra Leone. In February this year, they declared a uh, national state of emergency uh, because their rates doubled um, in terms of sexual and gender-based violence. And so when activists and protesters call for a state of emergency, a lot of people are asking, what does that mean? Why? Um, and they only look back at apartheid as a way to understand what a state of emergency means. But I think if we look to Sierra Leone and we look to how other African countries have dealt with the very same issue, we'll be able to deal uh, with the problem and we'll be able to dissect the problem to stop normalizing this vicious cycle of violence. So what do we know now about the uh, killer of Uinene Mkwechano? We know that the killer is on a sexual offenses list, a sexual offenders list, um, to be more correct, and that the, the, act, the police have a list of perpetrators or all sexual offenders, but this is not public. So now there is a call to make that list known and to make that list public. But his name is uh, now known, isn't it? His, his, his name, yes, it's yeah. Luyanda well, You can feel Bota. free to tell us, yeah. Yes, his name is Luyanda Botha. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we say his name because the sexual offenders list is not made public. And it needs to be made public so that we know if there are sexual offenders in our workplaces, um, if there are sexual offenders who attend the same universities. I mean, if, if we are asking ourselves, am I next? We need to know if that person who's in the same room, in the same workspace, may actually put you at risk of sure. being next. Well, and of yes. course, mm. at this time, we're talking reacting mm. to the scourge, to, mm. to the violence. I'm, yes. I'm not sure what else yes. is there that we can say to all women and children, for that matter, but this time, particularly women and people. You know, I, I, I wish I could, I could offer any advice, but I'm not suitably qualified to offer any advice. I may say it the wrong way around, but definitely since women live in fear, there are probably guidelines and ideas that you may want to share with them in the event they live in a situation where they are being abused repeatedly, for instance. I, I think before I even yeah. give the advice to women, I think there's a conversation on what do we need to say to men. Yes. Because men 
are the rapists, men predominantly. It, when we talk these statistics, it's predominantly men who rape, who abuse, who kill. So I feel like sometimes when we talk in the narrative of the, high, this, the, the levels of gender-based violence escalating the country, it's, it, it, it invisibilizes who's behind it. It silences who's behind it. So the narrative now needs to actually start with men who rape in South Africa, or this, the number of men who rape in South Africa increases. When we put the message out there, we need to start telling men that stop raping us, stop abusing us, stop abusing a woman. If you feel that you cannot handle your drink at a party, don't go. If you feel like you may abuse a woman because of the way you think that they are going, walk away. If you feel, so it's time that we really focus on saying, men, stop it. Stop the abuse. We have had enough. We are tired of the, of the hashtags. We are tired of wearing black. We are tired of declaring a day, of this day, a day of this or a day of that. We are just tired. It's time that the abuse stops and it has to stop now. Stop yep. thinking of raping someone. Stop beating someone. Walk away. Sure. Do not go to places that will make you think of violating that, another that woman's rights. To that. And of course, yes. now, as we said earlier, some of the abuses take place in the homes. Mbalentle, a brief comment from you. Any word of advice to women who may find themselves in dangerous situations, especially where there's repeated abuse or there's abuse or, or potential or threat of abuse? Yes, I actually heard a very profound video that says, you know, even if we uh, speak out, we're still killed. Even if we keep quiet, we still are killed. So we uh, would rather die like uh, speaking out and fighting. And I, I would say if someone is being abused in a private space, they need to speak out. Um, these perpetrators need to be punished. They need, they need to see um, themselves uh, in, like, they need to actually pay for what they're doing, right? Mm. And um, the, the president actually came out to say that he wants uh, his response to the call to end sexual and gender-based violence. Um, the way in which his government is going to respond is to ensure that there's longer sentences. Sure. Anyway, um, thanks very much to, to yourself, Balent yeah. and Piwa, here in Johannesburg for being my guests. But, of course, this, the scourge of sexual and uh, violence against women is a shame on this country's image and the conscience of this nation and we've got to all speak out against it and discourage it wherever we come across it be sure to engage with the show using the hashtag the Mudisa network on social media and after the break we will be focusing on the south african economy